Hello! In this part of the video, we're going to talk about the heat capacities of an ideal gas. Now, you may be wondering about the plural version when I say heat capacities. Why am I referring to more than one of them? Well, we define the heat capacity of a system as being if we have a system like this, and if heat flows into it, uh, that will generally cause the temperature of that system to rise, and the heat capacity is equal to the heat that flows into the system divided by the change in temperature that results. Now, another equation that we looked at before was the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that the change of internal energy of, or change of thermal energy of the system is equal to the heat that flows into it plus the work that's done onto it. And if we combine these two equations, we get that the heat capacity is equal to the change in thermal energy minus the work done on the system divided by the change in temperature. Now we mentioned earlier that if no work is done, then we can define if no work is done, if W is equal to zero, then the heat capacity is simply the change in the internal temperature divided, uh, the change in the thermal energy divided by the change in the temperature. Okay, and in the previous section, we discussed what that actually means. We said that for an ideal gas, the work done on the ideal gas is equal to minus the pressure of the gas times the change in the volume. So if no work is done on the ideal gas, that means that the volume of the ideal gas is not changing. This is a constant volume situation. So if you have an ideal gas at constant volume, and you ask what is the specific, uh, what is the heat capacity of that gas, it's equal to simply the change in the thermal energy of the system divided by the change in temperature, which is equal to Nf over 2 times K, assuming the ideal gas obeys the equipartition theorem, which it does. We often refer, uh, we'll often write this as C sub V. The V refers to the fact that this is the heat capacity at constant volume. Now things change if we have a gas that doesn't stay at constant volume, and this is important because gases change volume very easily when you change their pressure or their temperature. You release gas into a room, that's one of the main properties of a gas, the definition of a gas, is that it will change its volume as necessary in order to uh, fit the container that it's in. And so this constant volume situation is important if we keep the gas locked up in a box, for instance, but there are other circumstances where the volume will not be constant as you feed heat into the gas, and we need to consider those separately. And the, sp and the heat capacity of that gas is going to be different. Let's look at the case where the gas is at constant pressure. If the gas is at constant pressure, Okay. What that means is if we assume that the gas is floating around in the atmosphere, sort of as its own cloud, right, then the atmosphere is pushing on this gas with 10 to the fifth pascals atmospheric pressure. And so the, if that cloud of gas is going to be in equilibrium with its environment, that means that the gas is pushing back. also with 10 to the fifth pascals. And assuming that, assuming we don't change anything too quickly, assuming that the cloud, that all our processes are quasi-static, then that cloud, that, that cloud of gas is going to stay in mechanical equilibrium with the atmosphere. And so that cloud is going to be at a constant pressure throughout the process. All right, so let's suppose we feed some heat into this cloud, all right? Normally, we would expect that heat to increase the temperature of the gas, right? But if we look at the ideal gas law, if the heat rises, then either 
the pressure of the gas has to rise or the volume has to rise. We've just said that the, the, this gas in this case, the pressure is constant, 10 to the fifth pascals. Therefore, as the temperature rises, the volume has to rise as well. And if the volume rises, that means that, that the gas is doing work on its environment. environment. That means that W is negative, not zero anymore. And so that means that we need to, if we revisit the formula for the heat capacity, that is delta U minus W over T, delta T, we'll see that this is going to be greater than the, than the heat capacity at constant volume that we saw before because W is negative. All right. What does that mean? That means that a gas at constant pressure has a larger thermal inertia. Um, that is, if you pump heat into that gas, it takes longer for that gas to, the gas won't reach as high a temperature as it would if it were at constant volume. And the reason for that is if we look at, the, if we draw this picture of this gas again, Right? If heat flows into this gas, in order for the gas to maintain constant pressure, this gas has to do work on its environment in order to expand. Okay? That means that you've got Q energy going in, but you have some of that heat is converted directly into work and leaves the system right away. And less of that heat sticks around to make the thermal energy bigger. less heat sticks around to raise the temperature. Okay. Um, we have a formula for W for a gas, so we can plug that in there for an ideal gas. We write C is equal to uh, delta U minus W, W is, that's equal to plus P delta V. This is assuming that the pressure is constant, so we don't have to integrate, uh, divided by T. Okay, this is called the heat capacity at constant pressure. And we can break it up into two parts. We've got delta U over delta T plus P times delta V over delta T. This first term is the heat capacity at constant volume plus there's ex this extra little bit which is, which is proportional to how much the volume of the gas changes. Okay. For an ideal gas, we can be even more specific. For an ideal gas, we assume that an ideal gas obeys the equipartition theorem. Let's do a new page here. The ideal gas, so we've got uh, Cp is equal to uh, delta U over delta T plus P times delta V over delta T. For an ideal gas, uh, U is equal to N F over 2 K T. So that means delta U, the change in the thermal energy, is equal to N F over 2 K delta T. So that means that that first term is just equal to N times F over 2 times K, which we already saw in class. Uh, the second term, P delta V over delta T, that comes, we can simplify that using the ideal gas law. We've got P V is equal to N K T. And if we assume that this is constant, we assume that P is constant, then we can write this as P delta V is equal to n k delta t. Why can I do that? Well, let's let's spell this out just in case you you just think I'm sticking deltas in for no reason. Um, let's assume that we know that the final velocity, the pressure, and the number of particles in k are all constant; they're not changing, but the volume is changing. So that means that there's a final volume v f, and there's a final temperature t f, 
and there is a initial volume, Vi, and an initial temperature, Ti. And if I subtract these two equations from each other, I get P times Vf minus Vi is equal to Nk times Tf minus Ti. That is P times delta V is equal to Nk delta T. And that's why I can slip the delta in uh, on the two sides, and that's only because P and N are constants. Okay, and so if I take this result here, this equation, and I look up here, if I take this, this equation right here and I divide both sides by delta T, I get that P delta V over delta T is equal to NK. All right. So that means that the heat capacity at constant pressure is equal to, we can either write it as NF over 2K plus another NK. Okay. Or sometimes you'll just see this written as the heat capacity at constant pressure is equal to the heat capacity at constant volume plus this additional term NK. Or chemists will write this Instead of Nk, they'll write this as the number of moles times the gas constant. That works as well. Okay, I'm going to stop the video here, and I will, just to make sure it worked, and I will, next we will talk about the ideal gas.